Thanks for the introduction. So how many of you in here are already familiar with radically open security? Raise your hand. OK. Always less hands than I expect. Um, so I guess I'll first uh, tell you a little bit about uh, myself and also a little bit about radically open security, because uh, a lot of that is necessary context for actually understanding also the technological side of my story. So Radically Open Security, first of all, is a social enterprise in the security consultancy space. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, we're actually set up, believe it or not, as a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Sounds a bit weird. It is. <laughs> But uh, what we essentially have aimed to do, we are set up as something called a fiscal fundraising institution, a fiscal fondswerfende instelling, which is this really obscure tax construction from the Dutch church. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, by law requires us to donate 90% or more of our profit to charity. So uh, why did I choose to set my company up in this fashion? Because a lot of, cons well, security companies are very commercial. Uh, and I did not believe that uh, acting commercially, maximizing for profit always, you know, is the best thing for society. So uh, basically we uh, give 90% of our profits to the NLNet Foundation. Uh, NLNet is a foundation that's been around for almost 20 years. They were actually uh, one of the first ISPs in the Netherlands. They got acquired by what's now KPN. And since then, they have been giving money away to really great initiatives that make the internet better, like GNU, EFF, Tor, Jitsi, DNSSEC, WireGuard, you know, all kinds of academic research, all kinds of really great projects that make the internet better. So I wanted to set up a company that was by the community, for the community, and that actually attempted to completely separate profit motive from the operational vehicle of business, you know, thus repurposing a security company as a vehicle for pure positive impact. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too much more time uh, talking about my business model because that is not what this talk is about today. However, if you are curious to know more, I would highly recommend you to listen to my TEDx Berlin talk. Uh, this past uh, June, I gave uh, a talk and uh, the video came online about, I think, about a month and a half ago. So uh, if you like uh, te TED Talks, uh, basically I explain in exactly 18 minutes what my business model is. But I'm going to leave it there for today since that's not what this is about. Um, another thing that I want to say about Radically Open Security is that we are a globally distributed team. Uh, you know, given today's world of IT and how things are changing, this is not so unusual, you know, to have globally distributed teams. <laughs> uh, but this also informs uh, the architecture that we use for our penetration testing process. So let's begin. What is chat ops? Please raise your hand if you have heard the term chat ops before. Very few hands. Okay. So what this is. Um, Chat ops is essentially taking uh, chat rooms. So uh, I'm sure many of you have used uh, Slack before. Raise your hand if you've used an environment similar to Slack. OK, that's almost everybody. So uh, how many of you have ever used a chat bot? So like Hubot or some, oh, quite a lot. OK, then you might be doing chat ops and not even knowing it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so what chat ops is, is it is taking your chat room and then using a chat bot to essentially turn your chat room into a kind of command and control center for your operations. So about three years ago, I went to the DevOps days in Amsterdam and I heard this absolutely brilliant talk from GitHub. GitHub, uh, similar to Radically Open Security, is also a distributed company. So I believe they have an office uh, in Silicon Valley somewhere, but they also have staff all over the world. 
So also in the Netherlands, but just literally all over the place. Now what they did is they created this open source chatbot called Hubot. Okay, it's freely available, open source. And uh, what GitHub did is they actually use this chatbot as a, you know, they turned it into a kind of command line for their DevOps and basically for their system administration and a lot of their, you know, uh, uh, pro well, basically IT uh, practices. So for example, they uh, would put into the chatbot, deploy, you know, Hubot, deploy new server. And then a new server gets deployed along with some, in, and the bot spits back some information about the server. Or they would say something like, uh, Hubot, what is the uptime of this server? And then, you know, the, the chat bot would come back with uh, some graphs uh, showing the uptime. So now the brilliant part about this is it actually allows you to mix operations, in other words, commands, with human conversation. <laughs> so what you can do is you can have a conversation with your staff members about what needs to be done in the chat room, and then you can issue the command, get the output back from the chat bot, and then you can continue the discussion and comment on what the chat bot just did. So it's actually a really brilliant way of integrating, you know, your workflow with the actual human conversation you're having that's discussing what you're doing. So uh, I saw this, you know, presentation from GitHub, and it was like, you know, the heavens parted. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my God, this would be perfect for penetration testing. Yeah. So I ran home, and we set up uh, Rocket Chat. So Rocket Chat, how many here have ever heard of Rocket Chat? <laughs> Quite a few. That's good. So Rocket Chat is an open source self-hosted clone of Slack. Okay, how many of you also have used uh, Mattermost? Raise your hand, a smaller number of hands. Okay, that's also a very similar open source self-hosted uh, Slack clone uh, that is uh, created by GitLab, uh, the company. So anyway, but we happen to use uh, Rocket Chat and I would absolutely highly recommend it for anyone. For those of you who are using Slack, just let me ask the question, first of all, why do you want to pay for it? <laughs> I mean, you know, I like free as in freedom. I also like free as in beer. Um, and on top of that, think about it in terms of data governance. You know, as they say, there is no cloud. There's only other people's computers. <laughs> so, you know, me as a security company, you know, putting my customer's pen test data in somebody's cloud, in Slack's cloud, is completely unacceptable. So, uh, you know, for that reason alone, you know, we need to uh, host our own chat solution. So, um, and I would highly consider that uh, most of you here in this room, if you are using Slack, uh, do the same. Anyway, but, uh, but the point is, we ran home, we set up Rocket Chat, and we set up Hubot, this chat bot. And then one of the first things that we tried was, uh, you can see right here, there's this command, and it says Rossbot pug me, okay? I type that in and it spits out a picture of a pug. Now, pretty useless, <laughs> but you know, it gives an idea of you know, the, basically the workflow, that kind of uh, invoke and response that you get from the chatbot. Not to mention, you know, pugs are important, you know, corporate culture, you know. <laughs> anyway. So, but what does this have to do with pen testing? So, what we've done is we have created a number of different pen testing related tools that we can invoke using our chatbot as a command line. So here's a more pen testing specific example. We, uh, like every company in the universe, uh, have quotations uh, that we give to our uh, customers, you know, uh, at the beginning of assignments. Uh, we call it, of course, an offerta because we're a Dutch company. <laughs> uh, so you can see right here, we uh, there's a channel that's called Off Melanie Demo. So in this particular case, Off is for Oferta. So um, we have a script that we wrote that is called Quick Scope. Okay, and what Quick Scope does is it takes an A4's worth of XML. Uh, you can basically just fix in the fill in the XML with the, the the briefest you know bunch of details about the pen test that you want to generate a quotation for, and then you can call Rossbot Quick Scope. Oferta Melanie demo, and you can see that the raw spot now invokes that backend script. It says here, uh, rocking and scoping. And what 
it does is that bot now in the background has taken that A4's worth of text and added all the boilerplate and all the boring stuff. You know, like every pen testing company in the universe, we have automated away all the boring stuff, <laughs> you know. But it expands the A4 and now into a full-fledged, you know, 13 pages worth of XML in case we need to change anything fiddly, you know, in the boilerplate. We don't. So what we're going to need, what we're going to do is we call this time raw spot build quotation offer to Melanie demo. And then now it's going to take that expanded 13 pages of XML <laughs> and it is going to compile it basically using the back end tool chain. So you can see right here now it's using Saxon and it's uh, compiling it together with uh, XSLT style sheets. And then what we wind up getting is a clickable link for essentially a, uh, uh, the, the, re the, the just compiled document that has just been checked into our GitLab repository. Okay? You can also see that this uh, uh, quotation was automatically password protected uh, because we have uh, some uh, customers, uh, well, we care about op OPSEC, of course, we're a security company. So basically, you need to uh, take the password from this channel uh, in order to be able to decrypt uh, the PDF to see it, which is also great, of course, uh, you know, uh, for security reasons because if PDFs uh, start, you know, are laying around on somebody's hard drive, most of the time, people don't actually save the password from the chat room. So it, uh, anyway, it's, a bit, it's cleaner to do it that way. But uh, yeah, so anyone now who is in this chat room can observe the fact that I just compiled the report. And as long as they have permissions to access that specific GitLab repository, they can now click on that link and essentially open that PDF. Super easy, you know? Makes things really transparent. So, um, you know, this uh, XML pen test automation suite that we have developed, uh, now is a good time to mention that we have also open sourced it. Okay? So this, uh, in fact, not only have we open sourced it, but we made it an OWASP project. It's called OWASP pen text. Okay? So anyone is free to use it. If you uh, need to create your own uh, pen test reports, uh, you know, we're constantly working on it, constantly making improvements on it. Uh, also, all the chatbot code, by the way, that I'm describing is also available either in Git, uh, GitHub uh, or in our uh, gitlab.com repositories. We use that a little bit because of the integrated CI. Uh, anyway, I'll get a little bit more into that later. But, um, so again, you can see this is the example of the uh, XML, and this is what you get after you compile it. What does it look like? Basically, any company's, you know, any standard pen test report of any company in the world, really. <laughs> and you, all you have to do is replace the XS, XSLT style sheet to add your own logo and your own house style, and you can feel free to use it yourselves. So, all right. Uh, in the back, of course, uh, I mentioned that there's GitLab. So GitLab is the main tool that we're using for our document management uh, and uh, revisioning. So you can see behind the scenes, this is a bit uh, what uh, this looks like. We also use GitLab issues for maintaining uh, sort of like comments and things like that during the course of the pen testing process. So. But, you know, this is just one example of something that you can invoke using the command line while you're pen testing. There's so many other examples. So, for example, one time we created a passive vulnerability scanning tool. Uh, we did this for an assignment uh, during Alert Online uh, as an assignment for uh, SEDN. Uh, when we were doing this uh, passive scan of the .nl domain. And uh, we essentially combined uh, Shodan and uh, Census. Basically, back then it was called scans.io. And uh, just made it so that we could invoke, you know, this uh, you know, passive vulnerability scan on a particular domain. And then it would check the results into our GitLab repository. So again, you can combine frequent, you know, frequently used hacking tools and then be able to streamline it so that things go into the repository in such a place that they can automatically get taken along with the report. Okay? So, uh, but there's a lot of other things that you can also do with this chat ops workflow that is a little harder to do uh, in other ways. So we came up with this concept that is called a red-blue pen test. Okay? So what this means is we will take a group of 
engineers, you know, or coders, or sysadmins, or DevOps people. And what we'll do is we will uh, take, say, about a dozen of them. We'll split them into two teams. It's either going to be a red team and a blue team, uh, or a red team and a red team. And then we literally gamify their pen test, and we have them compete against one another to hack their own stuff under the guidance uh, with each team of one of our professional pen testers. So what it does is it takes the coders out of their usual role you know, of, uh, of writing code or otherwise developing the systems and then puts them really into the place of a hacker you know, for, for basically you know, two days to a week, you know, depending on how long they want the exercise to be. And they really get into it because it's gamified. You can see right here that uh, we built a scoreboard app that is supported by our chat ops. So you can see here that I type in good job blue. The chat bot comes back and says uh, incremented blue, 24 points. And then it spits out this motivational image. <laughs> yeah, geeks, we love this stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and it basically creates the kind of atmosphere that uh, it really generates competition, right? Now, the really nice thing about these kinds of red-blue pen tests is that afterwards, you know, the number one comment that we tend to get from our developers that we're participating is, and I quote, I will never look at code the same way again. And this is what it's all about, of course. <laughs> so, you know, another nice thing about inv really involving uh, developers with the penetration test process is it removes the hostility. You know, when you come in as a penetration tester, you know, we come in as third parties and it sort of feels to the developers like we're coming in and we're saying, you're doing this wrong. Yeah? And what kind of a reaction then do you get? Well, you get a defensive reaction, you know? No, I'm not. Or, you know, yeah, but a manager signed off on this. <laughs> you know, or, uh, yeah, but you guys are like super geniuses and like not everybody can do that. <laughs> yeah. But if the developers are actually involved in the hacking process itself, <laughs> not only are you maximizing for the transfer of hacker mindset, which of course is super important, you know, because <laughs> of course security is not a set of band-aids that you get, you know, that you apply after receiving pen test reports, but of course, you know, security is a mindset, security is a process. But also, you know, because they are actually actively involved in that pen testing process, not only are they not defensive about it, but they actually can take some ownership of that hack. You know, if they were actually helping you while you were busy hacking their stuff, then they can actually look at that and say that, you know, I did that. <laughs> and they can actually be kind of proud of it. <laughs> you know, so these are reasons why it's super helpful, you know, to try and include your staff and not just your staff, but your vendors. Yes, your vendors, <laughs> because you, you, know, you are using third-party hosting platforms, you are using third-party software, and as far as I'm concerned, as long as everybody has signed NDAs, I say the more the merrier. <laughs> you know? And this can even be helpful for improving the relationships between your company and your vendor. <laughs> you know? So anyhow, th there's really a whole lot of win that you can get from, it, from this. And truthfully, it's really hard to do these kinds of exercises if you don't have chat ops in place. You know, but, you know, it turns out that there's a whole lot more things we can do with uh, pen, uh, pen testing chat ops. So basically, any scanning tool, you know, <laughs> uh, you can essentially uh, tool up and basically attach to the chat bot, and, you know, whether it's a web scanning tool, whether, like, you know, like, uh, you know, W3AF or whether it is a, uh, you know, SQL injection tool like SQL map or even if you're doing things like brute forcing passwords, you know, you, you can launch and invoke all of this via the chat. Yeah? Well, one thing I forgot to mention, but this is actually quite an important detail, is also with our own uh, pen testing, not just with the red-blue pen tests, but also with our normal penetration testing, we are, really our entire workflow is what I call, what we call peak 
over our shoulder. Okay? So what this means is we invite our customers, and this is standard all the time, we invite our customers to join us in the chat room. So our customers can overhear every single conversation that our hackers are having in the course of breaking their stuff. Super educational. <laughs> Sometimes entertaining. <laughs> Usually entertaining. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it really leads to an open and transparent workflow, you know, which maximizes for knowledge transfer you know, from the hackers to the customers. But strangely enough, that knowledge transfer also works equally well the other way around. You know, a lot of people ask, yeah, but isn't it really annoying having customers in your chat room? Well, actually, no, it's not. And I can tell you why. It's awesome to have customers in our chat room. And it's because customers are like oracles. And it really prevents us from wasting time on a lot of stupid things. You know, like we can be doing a pen test and it is so handy for us as pen testers to actually have the developers of the system that we're testing in the room, you know, and or the sysadmins that are hosting whatever platform we're testing. We can then be able to, you know, if something goes wrong, we can basically just ping, you know, the sysadmin and say, hey, do you, uh, there's a problem with the server, can you reboot it? You know, or we could say to the developer, hey, you know, uh, what does this function do? <laughs> Why is this code path like this? Um, you know, are you using a strong password here? You know, <laughs> so we know whether or not uh, we want to waste time on uh, brute forcing it. And essentially, it enables us really, you know, to, to spend time. It also enables the customer to a limited extent to even be able to steer the direction of our pen test. <laughs> you know, I mean, occasionally the customer has this gut feeling that, you know, guys, maybe you should have a close look at this, this thing right here. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, we don't want the customer entirely telling us what to do because we are coming in as autonomous, independent third parties. But at the same time, you know, occasionally they have preferences <laughs> or hints or gut feelings that there are certain things that they would like for us to check. And what it also means is with pen testing, pen test scoping, it makes the whole process a lot more dynamic. <laughs> we don't necessarily have to agree on everything up front in the scope, but rather we can just agree in the time box and say, well, we're just going to start by looking high level and we can sort of dynamically adjust during the course of the pen test depending on what we find. Because <laughs> obviously some things that we find are going to require a bit more attention <laughs> and we can just dis discuss, you know, in the course of the pen test. This is so much win because, first of all, the customer gets what they want, <laughs> you know, because if they're constantly there and giving you tips. Another thing also is it eliminates uh, hassles caused by scoping problems, yeah? I mean, pen test scoping, if any of you here are pen testers, you'll know that scoping is really more of an art than a science. <laughs> You know, a lot of pen test companies sort of give you this, like, spreadsheet. I hate spreadsheets, you know. <laughs> and basically say, how many lines of code, what services are you running, you know, <laughs> et cetera. And they basically, you have to fill all this stuff in, in advance. And then, you know, then they come, out, out pops the time box magically, you know, from the spreadsheet. Uh, you know, with us, it's more like, you know, we have a human conversation like, you know, what do you want? What are you afraid of? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> you know, and, and, and the fact is it doesn't necessarily have to be locked down because let's say now that we made a scoping error. This happens, you know. <laughs> it's really easy to, to incorrectly estimate the amount of time it's going to take for you to do something. So at this point, let's say hypothetically speaking, we scoped a two-week pen test. We're now one week through the pen test, and just due to there being more than we thought there was, it's increasingly evident that we're not going to finish everything the customer wanted us to finish in time. What we can do is, because the customer is actually there in the chat room with us, is we can say, okay, dear customer, you know, we are now 50% of, you know, through our time of the penetration test. It is looking uh, obvious at this point that the system was more complex, you know, than we thought, there thought it was. But dear customer, we need you to help us prioritize what we spend our time on in the second half. And we also need you to say, you know, we should spend time on this and also you can help, help us to relegating some of what's left over to future work. Yeah, sometimes happy customers is really just expectation management, <laughs> you know? And also sometimes when things go wrong, customers are a lot less pissed when they see it themselves coming from a mile away. 
By the way, these principles don't just apply to security. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're a hosting company or a software company, just stop and think about how this kind of openness and transparency might make your customers happier. <laughs> so, again, and this is all open source uh, software that I'm talking about. You know, I, I, I actually, there have been examples of things like hosting companies that they actually heard my pen testing chat ops um, presentation and they actually went and implemented it themselves and actually, this was a, I'm thinking right now of a particular hosting provider and actually they're, Customers were super happy. <laughs> so, you know, stop and think about how you can apply what I'm talking about within your own business. So, anyway, but uh, coming back to this, uh, so scanning tools, uh, also uh, different forms of uh, recon. So, uh, you know, who is Google Passive Scan? Uh, of course, we also heard uh, from Nico this morning about OSINT. Uh, you know, there's also some tools I'm sure that can be automated and hooked in. Um, other things like uh, hash cracking. So let me tell you what's cool. I have implemented rainbow tables. You know, where the rainbow table is sitting on my backend server and I can invoke basically cracking a password hash from my cell phone. <laughs> yeah. So granted, of course, uh, this brings uh, qu yeah, attention to the question of operational security. <laughs> uh, it basically means if I can launch almost all, all of my company's suite of hacking tools against you from my cell phone, it means we need appropriate authentication <laughs> and also appropriate device security. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it also means that we need appropriate uh, access control also on the various parts of our system. Trust me, we've thought of this. In fact, one of the most frequently occurring things that happens when we get new customers is they try hacking us. I would say if they succeed, I'm happy to give them a discount on their pen test. <laughs> Hasn't, hasn't happened yet, but they've tried. <laughs> and and I, I applaud them for trying because that's hacker mindset. So, uh, you know, but, um, but what it does mean is we don't want uh, one of our customers invoking, say, my project management tools, you know. <laughs> so it means that we needed to construct an entire uh, ACL, basically role-based ACL construction that we use for actually managing which people in which groups are actually, uh, uh, well, allowed to use uh, which sets of commands. So the other thing also is, uh, of course, we have a, a wide degree of different chat rooms, and of course, the, also the chat rooms themselves uh, also separate, you know, customers into different. Uh, we're, we're busy right now. I should also mention with a uh, large-scale DevOps refactoring of our tools, because I don't personally think that Rocket Chat offers enough isolation. So we're also trying to run different Rocket Chat instances and different Docker containers <laughs> uh, for extra isolation. Uh, it's still not as far along as I want it, but I mean, basically, this is what we uh, are working on at the moment. Basically, we've already got it dockerized, <laughs> and we're just trying to right now figure out uh, how to get all the uh, federation uh, and stuff uh, working <laughs> across the different parts of the system. But it's moving in that direction also because OPSEC. <laughs> so, um, another really great thing that we can do, and this is also, of course, uh, a security concern is, uh, you know, ever since, uh, what was it, um, I think March or March of last year, of course, you know, GDPR, <laughs> right? So data retention, uh, especially with things like uh, confidential pen test results of your customers, this is an issue, of course, it is an issue. So right now, we're also busy doing a pilot right now with one of our largest customers that immediately after the pen test is over, we are actually, uh, scraping the chat transcript, putting it in the tarball, so basically, or I should say, making, putting it in the GitLab repository, creating a password protected tarball of their GitLab repository, and then essentially handing that tarball over to the customer immediately at the conclusion of the pen test saying, dear customer, here is your pen test. Save this, you know, take this, <laughs> yeah. Don't lose it, <laughs> because in a year from now, if you want to retest, you give us that tarball back, we will reconstitute that tarball for you. And then once you have it in safekeeping, guess what, dear customer, I am deleting <laughs> this repository completely from our servers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is basically also, you know, OPSEC-wise, 
you know, also the direction that we're going, and we're already running a pilot of this right now with our largest customer. At, once the pilot goes well with the largest customer, I'm going to bring it in for all our customers because, quite sim simply, I don't want all that pen test data on, on our servers. And and you know, common sense dictates you know what what isn't there can't be breached. So. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, but this is also uh, facilitated by, you guessed it, our chatbot. <laughs> As almost everything in my company these days is facilitated by the chatbot. Another thing that we do uh, via the chat and the chatbot is phishing. Okay? So, uh, you know, we do phishing tests just like most companies that are out there. Um, but we do it a little bit differently because we've got this chat environment. So what we do is we've got a set of chat commands, uh, and what we can do is we can scrape either a web page or uh, say like a, an email, like a news, newsletter or something like that. Uh, the script can automatically automatically instrument the links, uh, you know, w which basically then if you click on that in instrumented URL, it then takes you to our web server, uh, which then at that point, of course, uh, the web server Hook uses the Slack API to then send messages to the chatbot. So what that means is if somebody clicks on that link in that phishing mail, then basically the, uh, the chatbot says, this recipient address just clicked on this, an email with this subject name at this timestamp. So what that means is security officers from a particular company can sit there and watch in real time while their own staff members get fished. Talk about entertaining. <laughs> it goes further than that. Uh, also, if we are doing phishing with uh, forms that people can fill in, uh, we can also instrument uh, what goes into that form as well. So I can remember one particular time we were, uh, I was doing a phishing test for a hosting provider. And the hosting provider was, you know, at, at a certain point one of their developers noticed that something was a bit fishy about the domain name, <laughs> you know, that we were using. You know, a little special character in there that shouldn't have been in there. And the t yeah, the, this, uh, this developer started playing with the form. So we started seeing, you know, things come in like, you know, username, something, password, something else. Username, nice try assholes. <laughs> password, you know, something else. Username, something, password, SQL injection. <laughs> it didn't work, but he got points for trying. <laughs> So, you know, which of course also leads to the questions, was this guy doing this from a properly sandboxed environment? Because <laughs> of course, given things like, say, browser exploits, you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily safe to even be doing that. Nonetheless, you know, at that point, uh, the security officers were just like, we have to leave for lunch, but thank you, that was really entertaining, so. But this is, the, again, the kind of stuff that you can do with chat ops that would be near impossible to do without it. <laughs> so. So it's not just security operations that we centralize uh, in our chatbot. Actually, we centralize almost everything within our company. So things like uh, project management. Uh, you know, we do, uh, we make use of uh, Kanban like uh, every other, you know, <laughs> oh, I would say DevOps you know, development kind of, kind of company in the universe. Uh, we have a lot of projects. We have to maintain their workflow. And we have hooks that can interface with the Kanboard open source software via our chatbot. Um, other things, uh, things like a help desk, support desk uh, kinds of functions. I know a lot of you probably use uh, Zendesk uh, or other kinds of uh, those uh, support desk systems. And we have a similar system that we developed in-house. We use these uh, you know, so-called magic email addresses. And if uh, we can carbon copy or blind carbon copy these magic email addresses on our mails, then what that means is that the chatbot, basically our mail server, activates the, you know, the Slack API with the hooks into the chatbot. So then, basically, the chatbot can then announce, you know, we just received an email with, uh, you know, from this sender with this subject name. A copy of this email has been injected into GitLab's. Click here to read it. This is really handy because what we can do then is if we have a particular customer, and I've got some customers, like our largest customer, we probably do like 50 pen tests a year for them. <laughs> you know, so you know, there's a lot of cus there's a lot of correspondence going on also with uh, with the different business units. 
So what that means is we've written scripts so that the security officers from this particular company automatically get added to the new chat rooms that are created for their company. <laughs> But what it means then is that when we correspond with their business units, the chatbot can actually automatically inject these messages into the channel, which means we can loop the security officers in on the communications that we have with their business units without it actually requiring us to do any work. So this stuff is really streamlined. <laughs> So, you know, th there's an awful lot of win in this. You know, and a lot of chat ops is really about stream streamlining. Uh, charge. So we've also got something called raw spot charge. So, you know, we are a security consultancy company, and like every consultancy company in the universe, it means we have to track our billable hours. And if there is anything that hackers hate doing, <laughs> you know, it's the kind of administration to track your billable hours. But we use the chatbot to make it a lot less painful. So what a hacker can do is they can say raw spot charge, the number of hours, and then a description of what they just did. And then the chatbot then says, thank you, name of pen tester. You just declared N hours with this description. You have now used uh, M total hours out of you know, the pen test that was scoped as at, uh, I don't know, Q hours. <laughs> you have now used uh, L percentage of the hours allocated with the progress bar. Now this is super handy for a couple of reasons. One, because it's a constant reminder to our pen tests how much time they've used and how much like percentage of the pen test is remaining. So if they're starting to run out of time, you know, that, that, you know, that is sort of the moment when you have the dear customer conversation, you know, <laughs> we need to reprioritize and you need to help us. So, I mean, it's handy basically for that. But it's also uh, handy for the customers because, again, it's increasing openness and transparency on that pen testing process. So what that means is, you know, if you're a customer, if you hire in a consultancy company, time is money. And if you can actually see the pen testers invoking this raw spot, raw spot charge command, then it means you can constantly see exactly where your money is going. <laughs> You know, and, and from a customer perspective, this is super attractive. <laughs> you know, again, it's optimizing for openness and transparency in exactly what, what you're giving you, so you know you're getting the best possible value. Um, furthermore, I already mentioned role-based access control, uh, things like error logs. So we've actually got specific chat channels that do nothing more than tail error logs, you know, from different parts of our system. Why would we want to do this? It means we can actually get people to troubleshoot our, you know, troubleshoot our systems without needing shell on the server. Win, <laughs> you know, great for security. Similarly, also with uh, not just with error logs, but also with debug logs, uh, we've also got channels uh, for those as well. Um, of course, this is an awful lot of commands. You start getting a little bit of uh, command creep, you know, which means occasionally we also refactor our commands and remove, again, the ones uh, that we're not using often uh, because, uh, because attack surface. And, uh, but we all did create a help menu uh, so that uh, if you want some more help, you know, and run, what, what commands can I run? What is the syntax I need to run these things that you can get that command, that help also from the chatbot as well. So, you know, but what else can we do with chat ops? You know, it's like the sky's the limit, right? <laughs> and again, sorry, I'm going to get buzzwordy here, but you know, what if you could create AI chatbots, you know? <laughs> and then you could have actual conversations with a chatbot. I mean, what if that could help with onboarding new staff members? What if that could help with doing things like, uh, you know, surveying customers to ask if they're happy or surveying your staff to ask if they're happy? In fact, you don't even need, you know, natural language processing, you know, for that. I mean, you basically just need something that can uh, essentially, you know, uh, use a, a script, basically, like choose your own adventure style uh, <laughs> script. And then, but the nice thing is, of course, automated surveys are annoying. You know, they're super annoying. Like, if I receive a survey email, I, I just throw it away. I never do those things because they're annoying. But the thing is, if, you, if a chatbot were to be asking questions in the chat room about satisfaction, if a customer gives a surprising answer, guess what? 
there's human beings in the room <laughs> who then can actually continue that conversation. So the chatbot can instill the discipline of asking <laughs> while the human can then basically take that over to make sure that the human touch is retained. So again, a lot of win that we can get from using chatbots creatively. And this is research. So uh, we have, do things really differently for most pen testing companies. And because of that, we have won many awards. First of all, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce called Radically Open Security the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands. Now is probably also a good time to mention that, uh, I haven't said this yet, Radically Open Security, now it just turned five and a half years old. And uh, we have about 40 staff members, about 80 customers. We are a preferred supplier for Google and also for Mozilla <laughs> uh, and also the Open Tech Fund in the US. But we also have done work with the Dutch police and banks and insurance companies, also with a lot of tech companies, a lot of SMEs. And we do not-for-profit not for work at cost price for nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society. Yeah, and of course, that's the real reason why we get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and by the way, no, I will not do anything for Google. <laughs> Just saying. So, uh, yeah. So we won uh, this award from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, CIO Magazine also called me the most innovative IT leader in the Netherlands. And also, uh, the European Union actually called me one of the nine most innovative women in the European Union. So, uh, but at the end of the day, look, it's not about me personally. It is about all of our ideas. And it's about bringing openness and transparency into the penetration testing process. And it's also about uh, our business model and about the fact that we're doing a lot of work and research in the area of nonprofit and post growth business. So, anyway, with this, uh, I hope that uh, I stimulated your interest and curiosity <laughs> in uh, chat ops and uh, open and you know, transparent workflows, not just in pen testing, but in other areas. And I believe that we uh, also would have some time for questions. So, are there, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs>